Now before we start, is there a reason that being big and angry lends itself towards being green? I mean, of course there's the Incredible Hulk, but also people like Doom Guy. I understand being big and angry, I mean being big helps to beat the snot out of people when you're angry, but why green? I associate the color green with things like rolling fields of grass or trails winding through a beautiful forest. And you know, when it comes to fictional beings, apparently the color green is what you want to go with when you want something to be as predisposed towards spectacular displays of violence as possible. I mean, I don't really mind it to be fair, the Hulk being neon pink just doesn't really look right after all. And also please imagine that the Hulk on screen right now is pink because I don't own Photoshop yet and I don't know how to do that. And you know, uranium is green, so I guess green can have some pretty negative connotations. Anyways, uh, yeah, Warhammer. Auric war clans. Let's go. But first, a scenario for you. Let's say that you're journeying across the internet looking for whatever, it doesn't really matter. I'm not one to pry. Maybe, for whatever reason in your travels, you come across a website that perhaps isn't the most legitimate in the world. Suddenly, messages pop up across the screen with the worst of news. Your computer has been infected with a virus. Thankfully, a free antivirus software is being offered in that very same message. You download the program and just like that, you've screwed yourself. The real virus is now in your computer and your data is at risk. If only there's a way you could have protected yourself. But I have good Good news, because there is, with NordVPN, the sponsor of today's video. In just a single solitary click, you're safe, because NordVPN has this wonderful feature called Threat Protection. Imagine some jerk in a DD and d campaign who somehow manages to be resistant to every type of damage and makes the DM have to throw the strongest enemies possible at the party in order for the game to be remotely challenging. That's Nord, but unlike that jerk, you're gonna be thankful for what this service has to offer you. Intrusive ads and web trackers? No sir, NordVPN ensures they can't touch you. And it even scans URLs automatically and blocks malicious ones, which I personally find incredibly helpful. Because when I'm wandering around the internet looking for relevant images and whatnot for videos, it's nice to know I'm not about to get my computer clowned on because I saw some really cool Eldar art, but the website it's located on has more Trojans than the actual city of Troy. And consider that perhaps you've been tracked by some nefarious ne'er-do-wells who want to track you down via the internet and steal all of your Yu-Gi-Oh cards once you let your guard down. Because Nord blocks trackers, this scenario can never happen, and your blue eyes white dragon will remain safe in your hands. This can be shared across six of your devices, by the way, so assuming you don't own five different computers, computers and 10 phones, everything you own will be secure. But not only that, in that same click you can be in one of 5600 servers across 59 countries. That's, by my estimation, 59 times more countries than the one you exist in at any given moment. If you can't access a TV show you really want on your country's version of a streaming service, simply set yourself to another one and have a look. The same goes for video games that are for whatever reason blocked in your country. Or maybe you're a savvy consumer looking for the best prices and a game or service you want isn't offering any savings. No problem, since Nord lets you use servers in 59 different countries. If a Steam sale only applies to the German version of the website, then as far as your computer is concerned, you are in Germany. And because Nord is such a wonderful VPN, it also helps you avoid DDoSing or your providers throttling your streaming speed. If you want to watch all of Game of Thrones in a single setting, NordVPN has your back. If I haven't convinced you yet, then maybe this will do it. If you use the link https colon slash slash nordvpn.com slash pancreas no work, or with the link in the description and the pinned comment, you get a massive discount that's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Additionally, with a purchase of a two-year plan, and you get four months for free. Safety is no joke, and you not only have a chance to ensure you're protected with Nord's extensive list of services, but you have an entire 30 days to decide if you think it's worth it. We all know that money speaks, and between the discount and the trial period, there's no reason not to at least give Nord a try today. Download NordVPN today, and ensure that you're not only getting the most out of your internet, but you're safe all the while. Alright, now onto the Oryx. The Oryx War Clans, or as I'm going to refer to them from here on out, the Orc War Clans, are Age of Sigmar's version of the Big Mean Green Tide. Half of it anyway, not that the goblins are doing their own thing elsewhere. Good for them, I say. They've always been a part of Age of Sigmar, even in the earliest times of the Age of Myth. Initially, it was just the Bone Splitters, or as they were known in Warhammer Fantasy, the Savage Orcs. As fighting grew fiercer, the Iron Jaws, the real big lads, came about in small pockets where the violence was the fiercest, as no matter the setting, Orcs get bigger the more they fight. There was also the Cruel Boys, Oryx who were bigger fans of Mork than Gork, and were naturally stealthier and ever so slightly smarter for it. They all just sort of wandered around the mortal realms looking for things to fight and usually finding it in the form of Beastmen. Although naturally everything was fair game as far as they were concerned, it was just Beastmen were the usual enemy. As for their gods, or should I say god, Gork and Morka eventually fused into being after Gork and Mork fused. Yeah, I couldn't find anything on how that happened, they just sort of did it. Apparently whenever the greenskins are fully united, they fuse, but I like to imagine they watched a lot of Dragon Ball Z and practiced synchronized dancing until they got it right. Either way, Sigmar found Gorkamorka trapped in Amber and Freedom, whereupon Gorkamorka thanked him by punching Sigmar straight in the jaw. He also knocked out the magical dragon hanging around Sigmar in one punch, but that's neither here nor there. They fought each other for 12 days straight before eventually they stopped for a breather, took a look around at what they'd been doing, and had a good larf over all of it. Finally, Gorkamorka had found someone 
someone who loved fighting just as much as he did. And so he joined Sigmar's Pantheon and was actually pretty easy going for a while. While the prospect of civilization building was nothing the Green God gave a shit about, there was always a whole lot of monsters to point him at so he could go kill. So Sigmar would bring up a particularly nasty thing or group of things and ask Gorkamorka if he wouldn't mind smashing it, and he happily obliged. The same mostly goes for his followers in the Destruction Faction. Sure, they didn't usually help build towns, but if there was a buildup of beastmen somewhere or a really angry god beast that needed taken down, the Greenskins were happy to go stab it until it went away. This could only last so long, though. Between his own destructive impulses and the whispers of Zinch, Gorkamorka was one of, if not the first god, to leave Sigmar's pantheon. He declared a big wah across all the mortal realms. The plan was simple. Take all Greenskins and his other followers, tell them to rampage across reality, and when they finally hit the edge, turn around and do it all over again. And, uh, yeah, that was the state of things until the invasion of Chaos. By this point, everyone was panicking over the people who blew up the world last time making a reappearance, but not the orcs. No, no, no. They were having the time of their lives. The Cruel Boys raged guerrilla warfare and were pretty successful with it. The Bone Splitters were happy to fight as always, and the Iron Jaws started appearing in ever-increasing numbers. Chaos provides the best fights, after all, and the best fights create the artist of orcs. It's like that strong men create good times meme, except it's a circle that only ever creates bigger orcs. Indeed, when Archeon told one of his lieutenants to rid the realm of Gur of all orcs, Chaos found that it just couldn't be done. This makes the realm of beasts one of the safest ones from Chaos, and Gorkamorka one of the most successful deities of dealing with Chaos, after only Sigmar and Malekith. Props to them, I say. Flash forward through time, and the orc war clans are doing what they do best. Smashing things. For all the fun it is to talk about what the orcs are doing, they're not really, you know, diverse in their wants and needs. At one point, a god of destruction awoke from slumber. No, it wasn't Beerus, it was Kragnos. Also known as, Games Workshop wanted to cock-tease the Beastman with his model before revealing that it was for destruction and the Beastman can once again go to hell. An army of orcs fought him and got pulped by him before joining up with him when they realized he wanted to smash the same city that they did. Marathian Lord Croak managed to trick Kragnos into going away before getting rid of the orcs with good old ultra-violence, and now Kragnos is helping the cruel boys and the gloom spite gets out. As for the current Iron Jaw's main special character and Grimgor Iron Hyde replacement, known as Gortrak the Fist of Gork, he was angry that his plan to smash with the big city didn't go over so well. Combine that with the fact he's a bit miffed that Kragnos is kind of upstaging him, and he decided that clearly his problem was he wasn't thinking big enough. So he decided to go fight Archeon's stronghold in the Mortal Realms, the all points where all of the Mortal Realms can be accessed from at the same place. I'm fairly sure that's where the lore is at for right now. Though given that Nagash was able to take the realm leading to his home back, and the Stormcast flat out blew up two of the realm gates at one point, I'm sure Gorjak will have no problem with this. He's gonna go shove Archeon Archeon's head in the toilet long enough to establish a foothold and everything's gonna be great for the Iron Jaws. And that's most of the basics that you need or the backstory for the Orc War Clans. I mean, they're orcs, they like to smash things, and that's pretty much all you're gonna get with them across all Warhammer settings. So why go for them? Well, if you like orcs, here you go. Not much of a statement there, so let's move on to something more substantial. If you like an army where everyone is mostly on the same page, but at the same time is distinct in their identities, then you want the Orc War Clans. The Bone Splitters are all about embracing the savage side of Gorkamorka, the Iron Jaws love a good apocalyptic fight, and the Cruel boys, who are actually very unique as far as Warhammer orcs go, are stealthy, brutal killers who can actually aim, rather than the loud, boisterous morons we all know and love. All of them worship the same deity, all of them love a good fight, but they're all very distinct and it can be fun to create an army whose component parts are at the same time different and that united for all the ways they differ. And as much as I was saying earlier that all orcs are the same, I was perhaps just exaggerating a slight bit in this case. To bring up that Gordrak fellow again, he's actually pretty philosophical for an orc. He sees that Sigmar and all the other non-chaos gods love building civilizations civilizations and grand fortresses and stuff, and wonders what the point of it all is if you're not going to fight over it. At the same time, and perhaps unlike many other Warhammer or characters, he doesn't just want to exterminate all the other races. He dislikes chaos as well, because if you just blow everything up, then there's no more fighting to be had in that case either. I know this isn't exactly Socrates-level thinking, but for a Warhammer orc, this is some serious shit. So if you want to play as the army of rampaging morons, you're still covered 100%, but if you want to fluff your army as the closest thing possible to orc philosophers, you can actually do that here. If you're a fan of chaotic neutral, then these are definitely the guys for you. Something about orcs in old fantasy is that they were certainly a lot closer to evil than neutral. Not these lads. My personal favorite example of this is from the Hammer and Bolter episode about Hamilcar. Hamilcar, a stormcast, just strolled into an Iron Jaws camp like he belonged there and the orcs just sort of rolled with it. Before he walked in, they seemed more intent on turning him around than murdering him, and one of them even helpfully gave him directions after Hamilcar bullshitted his way into the camp. Cruel boys are a bit of an outlier in this regard, but they can still be convinced to work with others if a big enough reward is offered. And 
if nothing else, it's really easy to point any of the Orc War Clans towards Chaos and just say they will give you the biggest fight or they have the best stuff to loot. And just like that, you've got an ally until at least the end of the massive battle that's about to occur. Yeah, they're still happy to come to blows with any faction of Order, but they're overall much more likely to help others than before. In Age of Sigmar roleplay, a Bone Spiller Orc can even have the backstory of having been able to hear the heartbeats of whoever he was going to be adventuring with in the future. If it turns out he's going to be parting up with two humans, an elf, and a dwarf, then that's just the will of Gorgomorka. This is his tribe, and if some other greenskin says that's weird, then they can go pound sand. That sort of thing would never fly before, but it's here in AOS, and I'd say that's a really cool narrative development for the orcs. Also, if you want an army who's at home in all levels of the narrative, they are quite literally perfect for it between the three sub-armies that make up the war clans. The Cruel Boys are perfect for low-level engagements in some swamp, the Bone Splitters will be perfect for a mid-level engagement like the Siege of some moderately sized city, and the Iron Jaws belong right in the center of some realm-shaking conquest. Honestly though, just scale the numbers of whatever sub-faction you like the most up or down, and they'll fit well enough in any situation. Regardless of the specifics, they're still orcs. If somebody's gonna get kicked in the ribs, they'll be there no matter how many somebodies there are to kick. And finally, while he's not around by name anymore, Warzag the Great Green Prophet is now a generic unit for the Bone Splitters. Is it a shame that all of his character has been lost? Yes, it absolutely is. I love that orc. But on the bright side, because he's just a generic unit now, that means that there are entire groups of Warzags out there. Can you imagine it? A conclave of 50 different Warzags, all arguing over whose Fortnite dances best represent what Gorkamorka wants them to do. I can picture it perfectly, and it's a glorious sight to imagine. And on that beautifully stupid note, let's move on to the tabletop positives. The Orc War Clans are a very good army for beginners, being fairly simple to use effectively. Most of the units have pretty solid stats pertaining to whatever their role on the battlefield is. Each of the sub-armies also specialize in a certain field. Iron Jaws, for instance, are an elite army of hard-hitting maniacs. Bone Splitters are great for when you don't feel like thinking and do feel like throwing 100 plus units across the board at once while also having a pretty decent magical game to back them up. And Cruel Boys have surprisingly good shooting and a hell of a lot of mortal wounds to cause. Because each sub-faction has a gimmick, it's easy to get a handle on them, and when combined into a big WoW army, you can use each sub-faction and set as a part of your army. Cruel Boys sniping units that need eliminating, Bone Splitters charging up the field to soak up damage and tie up the enemy's front line, and Iron Jaws either charging into weak points or going for the enemy's own elite. And National Fur Orcs, they're an amazing melee army that hits like a runaway train and are about as subtle as one. Let's look at the stat for the Savage Orcs. Pardon me. Urix, fucking copyright, and see how they do. That'll be two wounds each, hitting on a 4+, potentially wounding on a 4+, and wounding better on a charge because eat shit enemy frontline. Iron Jaws units are naturally even stronger, and with the War Chanter, they could even throw in some light resurrection abilities, because why not? Even for the sneaky army, the Cruel Boy's basic infantry is still decently tough, because they're still orcs after all. To say nothing of bringing out the special characters, hey there, Gordrak, are you fighting Archaon or Gotrick today? No? Then I'm just gonna assume you're winning the fight. What's great about him is that the more things he kills, the better he gets at killing. So yeah, if you're facing Skaven, bring Gordrak. Throw him into a unit of Clannerets and watch him become a blender over the course of a few turns, then throw him at a Vermin Lord and watch it disintegrate. The bastard can even yell so loud that it counts as a ranged weapon. That is beautiful. Their general orky toughness also means that almost any unit in your army can function pretty well as either the hammer or anvil of your force. For example, in my humble opinion, the Bone Splitters charging up the front to soak up damage is their best use, but 20 of them suddenly appearing on your opponent's flank is going to cause them a bad day for sure. And with whatever you do, you are rewarded for playing like an angry bum-rushing moron. Get in there and start swinging and things will generally go your way. Onto the subject of orky magic, have you ever wanted to eliminate Archaon in one turn? Because you can. If you're lucky enough, you can straight up use Cyclops' laser eyes and melt him at a single turn. Because with the Wargog Prophet, every time you roll a 3 or higher, you deal D3 mortal wounds. But the kicker is, you can keep doing this. Over. And over and over. Sure, if you roll a 1 or a 2, you stop melting them and take d6 wounds, which so we're all clear on the matter is explicitly noted as the orc's head exploding, but that is completely worth the risk. If for no other reason than watching your opponent get madder and madder as his elite Death Star unit just disintegrates into the wind. There's also Foot of Gork, which is a similar deal. Casting value of 10 is a bit much, but if you pull it off, that's a cool d6 mortal wounds on whatever poor bastard is getting stomped flat today. And if you roll a 4 or higher, you keep stomping and stomping and stomp- yeah, you get what I'm going for here. That's so funny to me. <laughs> Other gods are all about empowering you with holy might or giving you the courage and willpower to face your adversaries. Meanwhile, Gork is just like, cheers mate, this one's on me, and kicks the shit out of whatever is bothering you. And this time it doesn't even hurt you when you roll under a four. Gork just takes a breather and stops kicking for a bit. There's other spells, of course, if for some reason you want to look at them, but they're a lot less interesting, so I don't care to mention them. Besides, between the mask and the foot of Gork, they're just they're just too fun not to use. Why would you use anything else? Much like the Skaven, if you're playing the orcs, it should be go big or go home. Each 
sub faction also has a variety of different abilities that's based on their aesthetic. For example, the Cruel Boys can rig a piece of terrain to be trapped and hurt enemy units when they go near it. And when you combine them into a single army, these are replaced with WA points that give bonuses to a variety of different things for different costs depending on what exactly you want to do. So you can synergize the combined army of your dreams or lean into what makes your favorite sub faction great and go whole hog on a single skill set. Lastly, for a positive that I randomly switch between placing it in tabletop and non tabletop because I am a silly little moron, the Orc War Clan models all look damn good. Right proper orky indeed. It does make sense while with two thirds of the sub factions being developed for Age of Sigmar, and thus being very new and having a lot of GW money thrown at them to make them look all purdy like. But even the bone splitters and their old fantasy models still look pretty good. Yeah, you can tell they're a bit older, but I still think they hold up pretty nicely. They've certainly held up more than the Chaos Warriors, who are all doing the exact same stock still pose. Seriously, look at them. This is the single least threatening pose I can think of short of the fetal position, and these are supposed to be Vikings aligned to hell. But even though it's Orktober, I must still acknowledge that the green boys have flaws. For the first lore one, as Warhammer Orcs, your motivations generally boil down to, we like fighting. Now there's a lot of different specifics you can work with. For example, the Cruel Boys love putting together bigger and better range weaponry to fight with. But at the end of the day, that's still a motivation that's based around stuff that leads to more fighting happening. And while the Iron Jaws and others might be a bit more philosophical than other Warhammer Orcs, that's still comparing them to the standards of other Orcs. There's no grand dreams of a perfect civilization or peace throughout the mortal realm, so if you want something like that, then don't go here. Because of this, and due to the fact that even the elite Orcs are narratively portrayed as a rampaging horde faction, in narrative events, they aren't the most likely to win. Because if they did and got what they wanted, another faction would almost certainly have to lose hard. To slightly backpedal on that statement, AOS is far better than either 40k or even fantasy ever have been with allowing their poster boy factions to lose. But still, the grand goals of the Orcs are perhaps some of the most unlikely ones to be accomplished because they boil down to, and then everyone lost and we fought forever. Sure, they don't want to completely eradicate the other guys, at least not in the same way that Chaos does, but that doesn't mean they want to cooperate with others or let them succeed. So for those reasons, expect to generally be both on the losing side and to be portrayed as the antagonist that gets mowed down before the real villain shows up in narrative events. Believe it or not though, I'm kinda light on narrative flaws for these guys. Maybe I'm just biased or there's a flaw that I'm missing that's right in my face, but I think they're resoundingly well made as far as their lore goes. And while this may be a bit lazy, any flaws I can think of would just be me repeating what I said in my orc video for 40k. Moving out of tabletop flaws though, there's a few things to be discussed. Each of the orc sub-armies have fairly noticeable drawbacks. The Iron Jaws, for instance, have a slow as all hell base move speed. And while there's a variety of ways to mitigate this, if you either choose not to use them or can't, they're not going anywhere fast. They've also got a bit of a problem with being able to cause mortal wounds. The Bone Splitters, at least by design, are supposed to be best at targeting big monsters, and if your opponent doesn't have many big monsters, you're gonna be feeling a bit awkward as your otherwise fragile orcs die in droves. And with that being said, from my recent readings, it seems like their monster killing capabilities have been nerfed, so they might be on the weaker end as far as things go. And the Cruel Boys are all about using clever tactics and subverting the enemy. Essentially, if you aren't playing like a douchebag, the enemy has the advantage by default. And while combining them together can help, you lose out in faction-specific abilities and need to use the big wah one. Those abilities are helpful, but gaining the points needed to use them can be a slow process compared to using abilities granted by sticking to one of the three sub-armies. In fact, aside from the big wah abilities you use with the wah points, I don't really think there's any buffs to a mixed army. The boys unfortunately don't play super well together. For some more general things across the war clans as a whole, their bravery isn't great. It's not Skaven bad or anything, but the lads might be a bit flighty when you want them to stay stuck in. Command abilities and other buffs can mitigate this, same as with the moving issues the Iron Jaws have, but the same drawback applies where if you can't use them or don't use them, you're gonna lose a few models to a route. Earlier I mentioned that many units can be either the hammer or the anvil. This is great for flexibility, but the flip side of that is that they don't really excel in either field. Even their cavalry isn't that much better than their infantry, it's just really fast and can hurt a bit more on the charge. So to make a comparison to 40k, while they aren't stuck with the Eldar problem of them being useless outside of their comfort zone, they don't have the Eldar benefit of being able to almost always win if they're in their element. As for their magic, they're in a very interesting position. Their spells are all pretty good, even the ones I didn't mention because they're not as funny as just stepping on the enemy. The problem is that their casters aren't great. Not where Zag is pretty solid, but the rest of them might leave you feeling a bit disappointed. There's decent odds that an enemy caster can unbind their spells, and if you're going against an army with either a lot of dedicated mages or one that has a super caster like Teclas or Nagash, you are not going to be winning the magical game. It's just not happening. Not too much of a problem against armies with little magical presence, but it's always something to keep in mind if your strategy relies on letting Gork take care of the heavy lifting. All of these armies are also pretty lackluster in terms of the allies they can take. You can get a couple hundred points of Gloom Spite gets in bigger games or take a Mercenary Gargan, but aside from that, you're stuck with whatever this faction has to use. Not the worst flaw to have, all things considered, but it's something you should keep in mind when building your force. For more model-specific problems to end off on, well, I hope you like green paint, because my god are you gonna need it. Especially with the Bone Splitters, because the nudist orcs are mean, green, and proud of it. So I hope you don't mind that your army is probably not gonna be the most visually varied one around. The models still do look great,
great, but there might not be too much diversity going on in between the same unit. Lastly, their pricing. It's kind of all over the place, but for the sake of argument, I'm assuming you'll be playing a mixed army. In which case, they're definitely more towards the expensive end of things. Bone Splitters are a horde army, so that's going to be a lot of money because of that. Sure, you get a lot of units per box of them, but you need to buy a lot of those boxes. Iron Jaws, meanwhile, may be elite, but good lord is GW not holding back on the pricing for them. Doesn't it just feel great to drop $60 on five models? And the Cruel Boys, meanwhile, get the worst of both worlds. Pound for pound, there's odds you're going to be spending more on them than the Bone Splitters, and you need more boxes of them than the Iron Jaws. Hello Gobsprack, how nice of you and your $150 price tag to drop by and steal all of my money. And there you have it, the Auric War Clans. I have finally decided to put out something Orc related this month. Next time I'll be sure to fix that and put out something Halo related. 77k subs after all, and that's the special bungee number. Though maybe we'll take a bit of a look at the old world first, see what's going on there. As always, thank you to my wonderful channel members. You were the Gork to my Mork. Without you, my cutting brutality would have no brutal cunning to go along with it. Actually, switch those two around, I like Gork more. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Just to reiterate on that last part, by the way, it's Gork and Mork, not Mork and Gork. I shall brook her no argument, and anyone who disagrees can go eat dirt.